Welcome to Times Past, a program to preserving the thoughts and experiences of members of our community. My name is William Heights. This evening, Times Past cameras are in the Wenham home of internationally known UFO expert, Mr. Raymond Fowler. Welcome to our program, Mr. Fowler. It's my pleasure, Bill. Nice to be with you this evening. There's a number of questions uh, I'd like to ask you about UFOs, so could we concentrate this interview on UFOs? Sure. Um, to give us some of your background, will you give us an overview of your experiences starting uh, with the college level? Uh, I have a BA, a liberal arts, from Gordon College. Prior to that, I <clears throat> served with the United States Air Force Security Service, where we uh, did uh, espionage work, electronic eavesdropping on our friends, the Russians. At that time, I held a top secret clearance and uh, a crypto clearance. Uh, from the Air Force and uh, college days, I went to GTE, Sylvania, and worked for them for 25 years in the Strategic Systems Division and the Communication Systems Division uh, on a number of uh, weapon systems, usually on contract to the United States Air Force. You uh, have been on a number of talk shows, too, haven't you? I've been on so many talk shows, I've lost count, uh, starting maybe way back in 1965. I think uh, the... Uh, the most popular talk shows I've been on uh, started around 1980-81 when I wrote several books. I went on a tour throughout the United States under the auspices of Prentice Hall and Bantam and managed to get on some of the major talk shows at that time. Up until that time, for the most part, they were just local TV and radio shows. Uh, what are the names of the books you've written? I've written five books. The first one was UFOs, Interplanetary Visitors. The second one was uh, The Andreas Affair. Then there was The Andreas Affair Phase Two, which was a sequel. Uh, and then there was Casebook of a UFO Investigator and, uh, and a novel called The Melchizedek Connection, which was sort of a fact and fancy type of book concerning UFOs. The uh, Andreas Affair was bought up by the motion picture industry, wasn't it? Uh, Universal Studios uh, bought the option twice and then bought the rights to the Andreas and Affair, and they are still reviewing it on an annual basis. We hope that uh, someday a mo motion picture will be made, but I'm not holding my breath. Well, they might, especially if it picks up again, uh, more interest in right. UFOs. It almost made it, uh, uh, well, then E.T. came along, and E.T. <laughs> put it to the bottom of the pile. <laughs> You're also involved uh, in astronomy. You are an astronomer also. I'm an amateur astronomer, yes. I've been interested in astronom astronomy since probably my early teens, uh, maybe 11 or 12 years old. Uh, the hobby sort of got under control in 1970 when I built uh, my own observatory and planetarium on the back property here. I teach astronomy for beginners uh, to adults at the local community colleges and astronomy for kids. And I have astronomy courses right here at home. So I'm very interested in astronomy. That's right. Um, could you uh, give us a, an historical background of UFOs? Well, as long as man has been man, man has seen things in the sky uh, which he could not identify. And when you go back to ancient medieval times, we're dealing with people who uh, are not involved in a technological culture, so they could have been seeing natural phenomena, for example, that we could readily identify, but uh, were not identifiable to them at that particular time. And many times they gave them a religious interpretation. I would say that the first well-documented UFO wave of sightings took place in 1896, 1897. If you examine the newspapers from that day in this country and abroad, you see the typical flying saucer type of reports back then, except they call them airships because there were no airplanes in those days, and we were just thinking of building lighter-than-air uh, airships uh, with hydrogen gas, balloons, dirigibles, and things like that. So they were coined airships. The next wave of strange objects took place uh, in 1944, 1945 period during World War II, and both the Allied and Axis uh, uh, services sp spotted what they dubbed Foo Fighters. And these were disc-shaped objects and globe-shaped objects which paced both Allied and Axis uh, aircraft over bombing missions in Europe and in the Far East. And then the next uh, worldwide wave took place in 1946, especially in Europe and specifically uh, uh, in Scandinavian countries. Uh, Britain, uh, the United States, and France were so sure that what the people were calling ghost rockets were Russian missiles overflying uh, European territory that they persuaded uh, Russia 
to allow an on-site inspection. And we sent General Doolittle over there with uh, other uh, members of the armed forces, along with Britain and France, to actually go into Russia and examine uh, their uh, missile sites. Uh, and they came back empty-handed and realized whatever they were, they weren't Russian. And then by 1947, UFOs, as we call them today, flying disks as we call them then, flying saucers, were being seen all over the world, and they still are. So I would say that the first modern UFO wave probably took place uh, during uh, World War II. Very little was said about them then, though. It wasn't until 1947 that the press in this country picked up on them. And that's when a gentleman named Kenneth Arnold, uh, a respected mountain pilot, sighted uh, nine flat, shiny disks over Mount Rainier, Washington, on June 24, 1947. So uh, that's a brief overview, a historical overview of the objects themselves and when they have been seen in the past. Didn't our government at one time have a circular experimental ship they were working on? The United States Navy had what they call the Flying uh, Flapjack in the early 40s. It's now in a, in a museum. It was very unwieldy and didn't do what they expected it to do. Uh, the Canadian government attempted to build a circular airfoil. Uh, they, uh, were, it was being built by the Avro Company Limited. And the United States Air Force worked with them and they produced what essentially became a hovercraft which could move maybe three or four feet above the ground. It rode on a cushion of air. Uh, but it was very, very unstable and that also was at a, an air museum. Trouble with a circular type aircraft that's very unstable in an atmosphere. It hasn't got long wings to store fuel in. Uh, and uh, they found that uh, it, as far as a circular aircraft operating within the confines of the Earth's atmosphere. It was a very unstable vehicle. Right. That, you mentioned that uh, to me uh, previously that the, the ships that are sighted aren't even built for flying in our, air, uh, in our atmosphere. They don't really fly, Bill. It's, they operate just like diving bells. They, they, come, they come in, they, they wobble almost as if they're, they're weightless. They do their thing. They usually don't go from A to B over a long distance. They, they're very localized. When they're through doing what they're doing, they sort of tilt up and they, they're drawn almost straight up like they're attached to a string or something. They just go right up. So they really don't fly. And when they do move, uh, they uh, don't create a, a sonic boom. They're able to take right angle turns. But it, it's almost as if they're being directed by something uh, above them, by some kind of invisible uh, energy. They, 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 they seem to have infinite mass to throw away, but don't, have to, don't seem to have any mass themselves. Uh, when, they, when they stop and hover, they, they sort of waft and wobble, uh, almost like a boat uh, on, on an ocean uh, of uh, water, but they seem to be on an ocean of turbulent, turbulent air. When they move, they, they go up and down like this, uh, almost uh, like a, a boat would in the water. So whatever they are, they seem to be able to almost become lighter than air and uh, operate, and not as aircraft operate, but uh, in a different way altogether. Right. When they take that 90 degree angle that they've uh, been seen taking, uh, do they wobble at that time? No, no, they usually wobble just before uh, changing direction after hovering. Uh, right. The 90 degree angle seems to be a, 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 a 90 degree turn without a, a curve radius at all, uh, which seems to be almost impossible uh, when we th think of uh, our own aircraft and we think of our own physical makeup, what would happen to us if we did something like right. that. And they travel at a tremendous speed, don't they? They've been clocked. We've talked to radar operators who've clocked uh, uh, UFOs along the East Coast here. We had an alert uh, back in the 60s, I believe it was, tracked at 18,000 miles per hour. Uh, that's orbital speed, uh, and that's within the near envelope of the, the, uh, the Earth uh, without burning up, without a sonic boom, and yeah. able to take right angle turns at this speed. Well, I can remember when I was in the service in the uh, 728th Aircraft Control and Warning Squadron, and our radar tracked uh, an unidentified object uh, going across the sky at that speed. At 18,000 miles per yeah. hour, yeah. So uh, when we had heard reports on it, we put the two together and we said it had to be something. We never did find out really what it was. They didn't scramble fast enough to get it. In the 1950s, a Commander McLaughlin, a Navy commander who was in charge of uh, V-2 experiments down in White Sands, New Mexico, they were using a theodolite, which essentially is a telescope that also gives you readings of altitude and azimuth, and they were tracking uh, a, uh, 
V2 and a WAC coprol, I think, attached to it when they saw something else. And they managed to get the theodolites on this object, and it was about 56 miles up and going about 7 miles per second. And they actually got photographs of it, which have never been uh, released. But that, that was a terrific speed for that time. It was certainly nothing that we had. It was egg-shaped, mm -hmm. and they could actually see it through the theodolite as they tracked it. Mm -hmm. That's something. The, uh, the government uh, set up Operation Blue Book to investigate some of these sightings. Were you involved in that at all? I was only peripherally involved. Project Blue Book was one of a number of UFO projects. Uh, in 1968, they contracted the University of Colorado to uh, perform a supplementary uh, investigation of UFOs, and I served that particular project as early warning coordinator. But the Air Force projects go all the way back to 1948, and even prior to 1948, uh, when the flying disks or flying saucers were seen in great numbers over this country, of course, the government became very alarmed, especially when they realized that whatever they were, they weren't Russian, they weren't of domestic origin. So the Army Air Force uh, in those days uh, set up a team headed by the Air Material Command in uh, July of 1947. And on September 23, 1947, uh, General Nathan Twining uh, provided their conclusion or their estimate of the situation at that time in a memo to the uh, commander of the uh, Army uh, Air Force. And uh, he said that the UFOs are real, uh, they're, they're not visionary, and he gave, them a, gave him a description in this particular memo, which we were able to get through the Freedom of Information Act, and uh, urged that immediately a project uh, should be set up to investigate uh, what they were, where they came from, what they were doing here, etc. And in January of 1948, Project SIGN uh, was initiated. Uh, SIGN concluded after uh, eliminating Russian and domestic origin that they could be extraterrestrial. And they set, sent a top secret estimate of the situation to General Vandenberg, who was the commander of Army Air Force at that particular time. Uh, on the surface, General Vandenberg rejected the uh, estimate of the situation. He said there was no proof. But at the, concurrently, he replaced everybody on Project Sign that was on Project Sign and brought in new people and uh, told them, uh, as far as UFOs and the public went, that they were to, to uh, provide explanations. The public was told that the project was closed, in fact. And meanwhile, Project Grudge con continued covertly. Uh, this was until March of 1952, when we had so many sightings in this country, banner headlines, uh, Congress pounding on the Pentagon's door asking for explanations that they opened Project Blue Book, which you mentioned. And Project Blue Book again allowed public participation in the Air Force UFO program. And they had to do this in order to get data. They were anxious for data. They even made deals with Life Magazine to use Life Magazine's worldwide correspondence to get data. They were so interested in data. But having public participation in the UFO program uh, caused an awful lot of headaches for the United States Air Force. Uh, their regulations indicated that they couldn't tell the public that there were unknowns, uh, that uh, they were only to tell the public the ones that they had identified. And uh, because of this, they had to give all types of explanations for UFOs, and it caused uh, the Air Force to have a very bad name. Not only that, the information concerning UFOs was highly classified, and having the public participation in the UFO program wasn't to the best of the Air Force uh, interests. So. In uh, December of 1969, December 17th, 1969, the United States Air Force again told the public that it had terminated its UFO uh, program and now covertly invest investigates the better civilian sightings and uh, concentrates mostly on government source control cases and airline pilot cases uh, under the uh, order Janop 146, a Joint Army Air Force Navy order, which uh, outlines what uh, military civilian pilots are supposed to do when they see a UFO sighting. They submit what they call a surveys report, which contains information vital to the security of the United States. Once they make an official report, they're subjected to $10,000 fine and or 10 years in jail if they reveal the contents of this report. Also in 1973, <clears throat> after the last huge UFO wave, worldwide UFO wave, UFOs mysteriously disappeared from the uh, national uh, newspapers. The only way usually you're going to find about, out about UFO sightings other than belonging to an organization who's investigating UFOs would be to subscribe to a local news clip service. And you would see that uh, 
UFO sightings are still happening in this country and abroad all over the place, but they aren't getting reported in the national press, which is very unusual. And there was one recently in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Very unusual that that particular uh, account in Alaska should get in the press. It was a month afterwards. Uh, it was kept out of the press for a month, and this involved a huge UFO uh, seen by uh, a Japanese Airlines crew flying a cargo plane, a Boeing 747, into Anchorage, Alaska. And they were followed for hundreds of miles by this huge UFO, which was described uh, as a bowl inverted upon a bowl with a rim around it. We call it the satin-type configuration. Uh, the pilots, pilot and the crew members described it as being as large as two aircraft carriers placed side by side. They tracked it on their weather radar to make sure that they weren't seeing things. They were in contact with the FAA at Anchorage and also Elmendorf Air Force Base. And they have said and they've maintained their story uh, that, that both locations also tracked it on radar. It wasn't mentioned in the press. It was kept very quiet. It broke in Japan around December 30th, December 31st, and got back into the press in this country after a month. And immediately, the FAA officials contradicted their own controllers. The Air Force uh, spokesmen also contradicted their own radar operators and told the press that, uh, the FAA told the press that the radar uh, was just a double image of the plane. Uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base officially said that they were just picking up ground clutter. Uh, the two smaller objects, that, which were seen with the big objects, were described as being uh, Mars and Jupiter, although they didn't look <laughs> like Mars and Jupiter at all. And the last I heard was that the FAA controllers were very upset about this, and the Japanese uh, uh, pilots and pilot and uh, crew members are still sticking to their story, regardless of what uh, our government uh, says. Well, those are probably the largest objects sighted, don't you think? I mean, that's huge, too, yeah, the aircraft carriers. The, we've talked to people uh, on a Minuteman basis uh, that have described uh, almost objects described almost as big as that hovering coming down very, very suddenly and hovering over the bases and then, then uh, going straight up again to a point source. Uh, whatever they are, they seem to be carriers of some kind to be, that, to be that large. They are not seen that often. The typical UFO is not that big. <laughs> mm, right. Would uh, that uh, be called like the mothership, or as, as some of them use the term? Well, that's, that's what the Japanese pilot called it because you had the two small ones and, and the larger one. But Usually, the so-called mothership is a, is a cylindrical-shaped object and uh, consistently is being reported as is, is coming up and standing almost on end and hovering and dropping the disc-shaped objects, almost like a coin dispenser out of it, <laughs> and they'll go zing all over the place, and then it'll go down like this, and then it'll go either move a while and go up and out of sight. And also, when the objects are taken on board, this thing will just hover there, and they'll come in and just like this. We had one over Ipswich. Uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, right off Cranes Beach, that uh, was maybe two or three o'clock in the morning, that was seen doing the same thing. Uh, maybe those cigar-shaped ships <laughs> go into the other one, for all I know, but that has never been seen, as far as I know. We haven't got any pictures of that, have we? No, we haven't got any pictures of that. Unfortunately, uh, civilian UFO organizations do not have uh, the equipment that uh, the government would have. Uh, Dr. Jalen Hynek, uh, the late Dr. Jalen Hynek, uh, who was the chief scientific consultant to the Air Force, has visited me here, right, in this house several times. And he told me that the standard operating procedure for gun camera photographs, which interceptors readily were able to do uh, on intercept missions concerning UFOs, would land, the canister would be taken, the pilots would be debriefed, told to keep quiet, and they wouldn't even see the film. I have a uh, tape transcript of Gordon Cooper prior to his becoming an astronaut, who was a test pilot. And he was out at Edwards Air Force Base, which was called Muroc Air Force Base in those days. He stated they had a UFO landing there because they had camera crews set up for uh, an experimental aircraft. They were able to move the camera crews there and, and t took photographs before it took off. He said the canisters were taken. Uh, they weren't allowed to see the film. And as he said it in his uh, sort of southern-like drawl, off to Washington, never to be seen again. <laughs> right. so, and very hard to get these things because you had mentioned previously that uh, at another time that you needed to know what exactly, what information you wanted to get into the material from the Yeah, we, of we've got thousands of uh, pieces of paper from the, the free, through the Freedom of Information Act, memos, documents of all kinds. 
but unless you know what you're asking for, it's very, very hard to get anything. And if it's still classified and they feel it should be remain classified, you aren't going to get it either. The National Security Agency has admitted after we brought them to court that they have hundreds of documents relating to UFOs. Uh, they were able to persuade the judge that uh, the contents of those reports affected national security and that the, the uh, National Security Agency uh, didn't come under the uh, mm. Freedom of Information Act. So we haven't been able to get those particular reports. Uh, tell us about some of the documents that are available that, uh, on UFOs. Well, some of the interesting documents we've received uh, haven't come through the Freedom of Information Act uh, directly. What, what has happened is we've, we've, is we've had sympathetic uh, people on the inside of the military that have given us complaint reports concerning UFOs, which is a preliminary report describing the sightings, what happened, and so forth, which later gets classified. And then having this document in our hand, we know exactly what we ask for, and they know that we have it, so they release it through the Freedom of Information Act. Now, two of the recent documents that we got concerning, concerned five UFO landings at Kirtland Air Force Base in the Manzano Weapons Storage Area, which is a hollowed out mountain with, which contains probably more atomic weapons than any other storage area we have in the United States, highly restricted area. And they describe these disc-shaped objects landing in the area. One report has a, one of the guards walking up to it with a loaded shotgun and watching it take off right in front of him. Uh, one of the interesting ones took place on a joint United States Air Force, Royal Air Force base uh, at uh, RAF Woodbridge uh, in England, near Ipswich, England, on the coast. And uh, they had a triangular-shaped object land at the back gate of the base, and the document uh, relates how armed security police advanced toward it. It took off and went into the woods, lighting up the whole woods with its bank of blue lights underneath and sort of a red light on top and animals, wild animals in the woods, rabbits and so forth, started running out of the woods. Uh, they found depressions where the f three landing gear uh, had rested the object on the ground. They found radiation. And it's all in these documents. But documents like this usually uh, come to us uh, under the table. And then as, when they know we have them, they know that they have to release them because uh, they're official, official documents. We've used the documents to investigate further find people who were present during these sightings. Uh, some of them retired now, some of them still active members of the military and are actually able to get to these people and interview them as long as uh, you know, we uh, do it uh, sort of undercover so they won't get in trouble and we won't get in trouble. So we have many, many uh, documents that indicate that UFOs are real and that they're uh, treated uh, as a threat, a potential threat to national security. I think they're taking uh, sort of the worst case position of what could happen and uh, unfortunately their public information program is based on this worst case uh, analysis of the uh, problem. It, the, is the government and the Air Force uh, so afraid of panic and so afraid that they have no control over these objects that uh, they want to keep it a secret, so-called, to protect the, the American that, people? That's one reason. One uh, document that we had released, which was sort of the initiation of the public information policy concerning UFOs, is a, uh, a memo, a Central Intelligence Agency memo, which directs the Psychological Strategy Board of the, of the Central Intelligence Agency to set up a public information program on UFOs that would minimize panic. That was one of the uh, indications that uh, they felt that the, the public reaction could be adverse and, mm -hmm. uh, and they couldn't do much about it. And the other thing was that there was no air defense against whatever they were and therefore this whole thing had to be kept very, very quiet. Uh, but we've had people who have been burned by UFOs, with people hurt. These are in the minority. The government doesn't want to be held responsible for something they can't control. UFOs uh, have consistently shown interest in atomic weapon storage areas, uh, highly restricted military installations, Minuteman sites. I talked to someone who was debriefed uh, or given a briefing on the UFO program just prior to his release from military service, and he told me that uh, one of the things that they're very anxious to keep uh, secret is how much we know about UFOs uh, from the Russians. He felt that uh, hard information on UFOs could be used to enhance our own weapon systems and uh, any breach of security could compromise uh, what, what we're trying to do at all. So public participation in the UFO program is a no-no and uh, 
banner headlines on UFOs cause headaches for the United States Air Force uh, and uh, causes congressional uh, people to uh, stress the need for uh, congressional hearings. This is the last mm -hmm. thing they want would be congressional hearings on the subject because it, would, it might blow the whole thing wide open. We tried to get the United Nations to, uh, to bring this thing out into the open and uh, a number of scientists and people associ formally associated with the UFO program uh, appeared uh, several times before uh, the Secretary of the United Nations, uh, Hugh Thont, and then Kurt Waldheim. But uh, the United States, Britain, and France objected strenuously, saying it would be a breach of their national security. Gordon Cooper appeared and, and testified to some of the things that he knew and stated that if the United Nations would sponsor an open scientific study apart from the military studies being carried on by other countries, that he knew of other astronauts and other people in NASA that would be willing to testify if uh, they could do so without penalty. But the whole thing was turned down, unfortunately. It's, it's interesting where uh, people that uh, wish to open this up and to make it available to the public, like Carter, for instance, in his campaigns, uh, said that uh, if they could, they would reveal this information to the public. Mm -hmm. And after they learn what's really going on, they clam up. They clam up. He's, Mr. Carter and I have a transcript of his, uh, his speech where he mentioned the fact that he would release all UFO information if he were elected only if it did not affect, not affect national mm -hmm. security. The regulations that uh, pro prohibit pilots talking about UFOs, even civilian pilots, Genop 146 is a regulation specifically designed to treat objects which are a threat to national security. And yet the Air Force tells the public that UFOs are not a threat to national security. Yeah, yeah. They're the product of hoaxes, hallucinations, and misinterpretations. Right. And, and they loved, uh, must love to get a hoax now and then because they can say, see, mm -hmm. look at all the hoaxes the people have been putting on us. In 1953, again, when the uh, debunking policy was established, uh, the uh, National Security Council at the White House asked uh, H. P. Robertson, a very famous scientist at that time, to conduct what has been come, come to known as, as the Robertson Panel, and uh, it was classified top secret. And we, not too long ago, got a copy of a sanitized version of that. And in it, they outline a complete debunking program. And one of the things that they stressed was using well-known personalities uh, to get on TV and radio. Uh, even Walt Disney, they wanted to use Walt Disney productions <laughs> to to uh, do exactly what you say, build up a case that looked like it was a real UFO, and then after everybody you know, thought this was real, then they pull a the rug out from under it. And they actually, in detail, showed how this could be done, and it should be done. And this is the policy that they've been carrying out ever since. And it's, it's a shame. But I'm sure that they're doing it in the best interest of this country. It's just that people like myself and people who have actually been associated with the UFO program uh, feel that the subject is much bigger than national security and knowledge of what's going on could uh, uh, affect uh, man's uh, evolution, really. Uh, his, his thought, his philosophy, his uh, religion, uh, across all of society, there could be some major, major changes. But why wait, you know, until something happens where all of a sudden something has to be told the public all at once? Why not? Uh, over the years, do it gradually. Of course, our own space program, I think, has helped a lot to acclimatize people to the uh, possibility that uh, extraterrestrial life is out there because we're doing it. But the, uh, what people don't realize is that when they think about extraterrestrial life, they think about beings uh, probably just a little bit smarter than, than we are. But uh, our sun is a, an average size sun. It's a very young sun. And there are so many other suns out there, millions of suns out there that are perhaps a billion years older than our sun. And statistically speaking, if we are to come face to face with extraterrestrial life, it probably won't be a thousand years ahead or a million years ahead. It could be as much as a billion years ahead. And when we look at the fossil record on our own planet and go back a billion years, we see that we have some worm-like creature, you see. Uh, <laughs> So scientists say that if we are confronted with something like this, that we might be confronting something that's a billion years ahead of us. And I guess we have to hope that they don't have the same regard for human life as we do for the worm that I put on the hook and, 
and catch trout on a pleasant pond. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, they, they haven't bothered us much so far in hurting people. Not overtly uh, hurting people uh, uh, on purpose, but people, pilots have disappeared chasing uh, UFOs. Uh, one of the things that we got through the Freedom of Information Act was uh, an Australian pilot's uh, last words, uh, complete transcript after uh, a lot of pressure was put on the government by the, the uh, parents of the uh, pilot uh, and uh, UFO researchers. And uh, he describes this uh, cigar-shaped object uh, following him, and he, he tries to get away from it. And the, his last words were, it's orbiting above me. And, and then there was silence and a scraping sound. And uh, they haven't found the pilot. They haven't found the plane. And a vast, extensive air uh, sea ground search was made immediately after because he was in contact, radio contact with uh, Melbourne. But that's just one example. Mm. Uh, and you wonder what's uh, what's going on. People have uh, received uh, very bad burns uh, when uh, up being approached by a UFO. Uh, symptoms of radiation sickness, uh, hair falling out, uh, fingernails blackening, sores appearing, uh, diarrhea, nausea. And uh, one case uh, we know of down at Dayton, Texas, uh, December of 80, uh, a person has developed cancer. And they were so upset that they sued the United States government. And then when they, uh, that w they were rejected, that they appealed to a higher court, and they were still rejected. And we have all the records concerning the investigation by the Army, because uh, the Army was chosen to investigate the case because Army helicopters uh, or helicopters used by the Army were seen circling this object and pursuing it as it went off. And the uh, Army officer uh, uh, verified the uh, injuries to these people. Uh, and he verified that the helicopters had been seen in the area. But he also stated that no agency of this government would admit that the helicopters were theirs, that the object was theirs, and therefore the injuries sustained by the people had nothing to do with the case per se. Therefore, the government wasn't responsible because it wasn't mm -hmm. the government's uh, aircraft or whatever you want to call it. Hard so, to prove. It, you know, it, it is, except there are the people with uh, the burns yeah. <laughs> and the radiation right. sickness and the hospital records and the investigation by the Army indicating that, yeah, this did happen, but uh, it isn't the government's responsibility. And yet we've, we interviewed a Navy pilot that was approached uh, for quite a long time by UFOs. And uh, both he and his wife were sworn to secrecy, told that he may have, these, have symptoms of radiation seek, uh, sickness. We were given the uh, address of a military uh, hospital. And his wife was to bring him there immediately if he had some of these symptoms. And they would pay all the expenses and so forth. So what happens to a military person, they're only too anxious to take care of that person's uh, maladies resulting from contact uh, with whatever the UFO, you know, you know, power source or whatever causes. But when it comes to civilians, they, they don't want to admit that it happened. They don't want to take any responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. Well, they probably still have more control over military They person. do. Yeah. And yet this person took an oath, and uh, years later, he, he broke his oath. Mm -hmm. After the statute of limitations, he gave us the whole story. We see a lot of uh, information uh, in photo-wise, uh, interviews, and, and such as that. But what real tangible proof do we have that UFOs exist? Other than very, very good photographs, and there are some very good photographs, the negatives have been analyzed by experts and proved uh, genuine. Uh, you have radar visual sightings, radar visual sightings by civilians, and radar visual sightings by military. Some of the uh, documents that we have received through the Freedom of Information Act give excellent examples of uh, radar visual sightings where ground radar will pick up an unusual behaving object. Uh, an interceptor will uh, try to intercept the object, pick it up on airborne radar. Ground personnel, the pilot and the radar observer, will see the object. Radar will see the object on the ground and from the uh, airborne radar. Uh, behaving exactly is what they're seeing visually. These are very good sightings, radar visual sightings. You have physical trace cases. You have physical trace cases all over the country and all over the world where specific types of indentations, uh, imprints, scorched areas are found. Uh, one in Idaho might look like one they found in France, the exact type of thing, mm -hmm. exact type of object. 
indicating that something has been there. The French government uh, uh, recently uh, issued their first uh, civilian report. They initiated a, a multi-million dollar study uh, maybe five or six years ago, and uh, some of the physical trace cases that they have investigated, they, they claim are completely unexplainable, and that they seem to be attributed to uh, a, a flying machine, uh, which they don't know the origin of the flying machine, or how it's sustained, or so forth. It's an unidentified flying object that's caused these traces. So you have the physical trace cases, you have the physical reaction to sightings, which I've just mentioned, the, uh, the burns, the radiation, uh, radiation left at the site. Then you have the overwhelming anecdotal data from people all over the world from all walks of life, trained observers who don't just see a distant light in the sky, but they see something as close as my car in the driveway, you know, pull up beside them wingtip formation, and they're able to watch it for 15 to 20 minutes, more than one person, describing the same thing, the same flight characteristics as people are doing all over the world. So that's the type of uh, evidence we have. Uh, there are those who feel that the government has hardware. Gordon Cooper, again, uh, indicated that he has heard some highly placed rumors concerning crashed UFOs, a retrieval, he says, not only of just the UFO, but uh, remains of uh, bodies. I came close, closest to a report like this, uh, talking to an individual at GTE who holds a high managerial position, who has a top secret clearance and who worked as a civilian for the Air Force back in 1953. And his expertise was uh, uh, landing gear and also assessing the damage done to uh, crashed aircraft. And he was on loan to the Atomic Energy Commission uh, out at uh, Frenchman's Flats, Nevada at the time. And he was assessing damage done to uh, bridges and different types of buildings that were subjected to atomic bomb tests from different heights. There'd be atomic bombs on towers and drop a parachute and so forth. And he claims that right in the middle of these tests that he was called away and told to report to a certain office that he was going to have to go on a, a uh, two-day mission to a three-day mission for something that he couldn't write or talk about. And he claims, just briefly, the story goes like this. He was flown from Indian Springs Air Force Base to a civilian uh, airfield in uh, Arizona. Uh, I think it was... Uh, I think it was Tucson or Phoenix, I can't remember. I'd have to look at the report. But at the airfield, he was met by a, an air policeman who escorted him to a, a, a military bus that had all the windows blacked out. He got on the bus, and he was told not to talk to anybody, to surrender all his valuables, which he did, and they put him in a cloth bag, put his name on it. A full colonel, after everybody was assembled, uh, told them that we're going to go for a long ride, that they were not to talk to each other, that they were going to investigate the, the crash of a super-secret vehicle, which they couldn't talk about, and they had to take an oath. And when they finally got there, he, think, he thought they drove around for two or three hours. He didn't know. They took his watch away. When they got there, there was a bright light on the bus, blinding bright light. And when it was his turn to get out, he says he couldn't see anything. This light was just blazing. And when they finally got behind the light, there was this 30-foot in diameter object shaped like a bowl, inverted upon a bowl with a slight rim around it with uh, orifices. And he was told to determine the falling speed and forward speed at time of impact. And... Uh, that was all. And he wasn't to ask any other questions about the object. He said that there were generators there, there were uh, power cables going into the object, there was a, an opening, and there were people inside doing something. There was a tent pitched beside the object with remains of small beings. <laughs> and, but he wasn't allowed to ask any questions and so forth. Uh, when he got back to the bus, they were all told, each person that went out and did their own thing, that they were going to go back and they were going to handwrite a report of their findings. They were not to type it. They were to call a number. It would be reported. That would be, be picked up. And uh, they were sworn to secrecy. Now, that's just uh, a peripheral summary of what uh, this fellow told me. I uh, conducted a character reference check, went all the way back from where he works at GTE now, all the way back to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which was Wright Field in those days. Talked to people there, highly placed people who were still there knew this individual. Everybody gave him a clean bill of health. He didn't seek any publicity. Uh, he was, uh, there was a movie called Hangar 18 that came out, uh, put out by Sun Classics, and they called me because they knew of this particular sighting that I had investigated. They offered this fellow money through me to do a documentary. He returned it down. He didn't want to uh, uh, 
uh, compromise uh, you know, the, the story at all in any way using his name because of his position at GTE and because what his peers would think of him because he had taken an oath. So uh, you have highly placed rumors that they actually have uh, crash retrieval cases. Whether they're true or not, we only can wait and see, but they come from people uh, with impeccable credentials. Right. Well, these um, remains that they had of the vehicle and of some kind of uh, person or whatever it was, then I, I would believe that they would, the government would put them somewhere rather than dispose of them. Oh, they wouldn't dispose of them. Uh, <laughs> from what we gather, talking to, to uh, quite a few people uh, over the years, uh, they uh, are being kept at certain places and that the autopsies have been performed and so forth and so on. But all of these things are highly placed rumors and uh, it's not as objective as uh, sighting a UFO sitting on a uh, quadruped or tripod legs, uh, watching it take off a, a, a lot of witnesses and then going and finding indentations, radiation, and burned areas. I mean, that's something tangible that you can take a picture of. You can, there was one sighting down in Socorro, New Mexico. Uh, we found out from uh, Dr. William Powers, who was an Air Force astronomer who helped investigate that case. He said that they use a penetrometer on each one of those uh, pad marks, and uh, there was a ton sitting on each one of those. He said the center of gravity uh, within the quadruped landing gear was right over burn number one. Uh, it was uh, seen or heard by about 13 different people. One policeman actually got within 15 feet of it before it started to make noises and sort of a blue uh, plasma-like flame came out of the bottom and he had to retreat about 50 feet and dove to the ground, but he watched it uh, slowly take off. He watched the, the blue plasma just go up like that out of sight until it was just sitting there, then it was a high-pitched whine, a low-pitched whine, and it just sat there, no noise at all, and then it started moving away like this. And he went to try to radio for, uh, for help, and his radio wouldn't work until the object was out of sight. But within minutes, uh, state police were there, and there were the indentations, there was the, the scorched mm -hmm. areas, greasewood was still burning, coke bottle or some type of bottle calcined, melted. Uh, that's the type of evidence that uh, we have. Uh, Mr. Fowler, have you ever seen a UFO? A lot of people ask me that question. I've never seen anything up close that I am aware of. I saw a UFO, though, a flying disc, so-called, back in July 1947 from Danvers. Uh, I was working on a farm there, broad daylight. And, of course, I didn't know anything about the typical characteristics of UFOs, but this thing was going to the sky, and it was a falling leaf motion. It was sort of descending with a falling leaf motion. I thought it was a parachute. I looked for the shroud lines, no shroud lines, no person hanging there. Uh, and about uh, two days later, uh, the newspapers reported that UFOs had been seen in Beverly and Wenham, which, of course, border Denver. So I, I've always wondered if people were seeing the same thing that I did. And I saw, I, I've seen several other objects that I couldn't identify, which I would call uh, UFOs. You know. Are you still doing research in that area and keeping your records up to date? Uh, yes, except I've moved to a different position for years. I held a state director's position first for the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena and more recently the Mutual UFO Network, an international uh, group that supports Dr. Hynek's Center for UFO Studies by supplying investigatory, investigating capability and documented reports. I've been now elevated to Director of Investigations on the Board of Directors for the Mutual UFO Network. Uh, and this involves coordination of uh, investigations in different states, uh, sort of overseeing the state director in this particular state, and keeping up to date a field investigator's manual, which is used by not only uh, the Mutual UFO Network, but uh, is used by a number of UFO organizations all over the world. And this is a training manual that uh, trains uh, UFO investigators different types of forms used, procedures, uh, different types of objects that can be misinterpreted as uh, UFOs. So it's sort of the UFO investigator's Bible, if you will. So yes, I'm involved. I also recently have put together uh, several courses on UFOs for children and for adults, which I'm teaching at the local uh, community colleges, and I might make the same information available so other people in other states can teach the same type of courses. Right. Tell us uh, about the Andreasen Affair. The Andreasen Affair is a, a close encounter of the third kind type G. 
Now, a close encounter of the first kind is merely seeing an object within 500 feet or less. A close encounter of the second kind is the same type but with physical traces left behind or some physical reaction from the object. Mm -hmm. Close encounter of the third kind involves seeing occupants in association with a UFO. Now, there are seven types. The Andreasen affair is a type G, and this involves the witnesses allegedly interfacing uh, with the occupants from a UFO. The Andreasen affair concerns an alleged abduction of a woman uh, back on January 25th, 1967, uh, from her home at South Ashburnham, Massachusetts. Uh, basically, uh, and there is so much detail I'll have to leave out, but just a brief overview of the case goes like this. Uh, Betty was, Andreasen, uh, was in her kitchen. Her mother and father and seven children were out in the living room watching TV. And the lights began to blink on and off, and a very, very bright red pulsating light shone through the pantry window, and then the lights went out. Uh, the father and the, the children behind him ran into the kitchen, all excited, and she shooed him back into the living room. And the father went out and looked out the pantry window to see where the light was coming from, and he saw a number uh, of uh, very strange looking creatures, about three and a half foot tall, uh, with big heads, uh, very similar uh, to uh, this sculpted uh, head, uh, shaped like an inverted pear, with uh, huge wraparound eyes, uh, slit for a mouth, uh, very little nose at all, just two holes and a hole here and a hole here for the ears. This is the typical humanoid that's seen in these particular cases. He saw them not walking toward the house, but in the air, moving in a motion sort of like this. He described them as almost hopping like grasshoppers, and then he couldn't remember anything else. Uh, they came right through the door of the kitchen. I mean, they didn't open the door, uh, but they came right through the door. And they were in line, and they would disappear and appear, disappear and disappear. It was almost as if they could rearrange the molecules of their body somehow to get through the door. The family was put into a, into a state of what we might call suspended animation. Whatever they were doing, they just froze. And uh, they persuaded Betty to follow them. One of them left behind to watch the family. She was lifted off the ground, slid into the slot of this line of individuals, and out through the door they went. And uh, she was uh, given a very uh, interesting physical examination. I guess that's the only thing you can call it for want of uh, a better description. And during this physical examination, they took a long pliable needle and put it up her left nostril and pulled out uh, a little BB-shaped object which uh, was covered with uh, uh, like wire-like whiskers on it. We wondered where that came from. Uh, and uh, we tried to find out uh, during our investigation, which used uh, hypnosis, to find out. But under hypnosis, when it when we tried to find out where that came from, she would get so upset that the hypnotist was afraid to go further. Later on, using another hypnotist, during a follow-on investigation, she relived an experience when she was 13 years old and was also allegedly abducted. And they actually had placed this uh, within her by removing her eye. Uh, it was a terrible thing to listen to under hypnosis. So that's basically what the Andreas affair is. It's typical of a number of cases which we call close encounters of the third kind type G. And what usually happens is you have a person in an automobile, uh, or maybe two or three persons in an automobile, going to a certain destination. They see something like a plane crashing in front of them. Their car comes to a stop. And then all of a sudden, the object is gone. And they continue to the destination and find that two or three hours have passed. Then they'll start having dreams about what happened in between. They'll have flashbacks while they're doing dishes. If they get to the right people under hypnosis, they will live a typical abduction experience and physical examination and being told that they will not be able to remember the incident. There are several hundred of these now that we've investigated fairly thoroughly uh, and by some, usually investigated by people who have very good credentials, psychiatrists, psychologists. And all you can say is that after investigating this type of case, you, uh, they relive this experience, they pass lie detector tests, they pass a rigid character reference check. Things that they report are similar to other cases in this country and abroad. So we feel that they, their stories are worthwhile being investigated and documented at this point of uh, time. Whether they actually really happen, we don't know. But we know that they aren't hoaxes. We know that they really believe that they experienced something like this. 
Is and she still alive today? She is still alive. I talked to her husband just uh, four or five days ago, right? No reoccurrences or anything? No, but one thing that has happened to people who have had an experience like this is uh, for a period of time afterwards, strange things happened, uh, which I guess for want of a better term, you'd use uh, the term psychic phenomena, uh, apparitions, uh, things moving in the house uh, uh, by themselves, uh, strange lights being seen. This sometimes lasts for a few days after the sighting. Sometimes it goes on for weeks. Sometimes it stops and it starts again. And uh, I've known people, we have some people up in Middleton, very nice uh, family, had a similar event happen on their property where they weren't abducted, but they had seen an occupant and the thing had landed up there. And uh, they had all of this type of thing going on in the house. They called in the priest to bless the house. Uh, they finally moved out of the house. Uh, but uh, God-fearing people, uh, character reference check indicated that they were real solid citizens and uh, had this experience. And uh, after the UFO experience, experienced these other things. The Andreasen family continued to experience things like that for some time afterwards. Mm -hmm. Very nerve-wracking. Very nerve-wracking, and uh, they want answers, and you can't give them answers. That's that's the the problem with something like this. You investigate it. They relive it under hypnosis, and uh, they listen to the what what has come out under hypnosis. Betty thought that this can't happen. Uh, I must be going crazy. Uh, she wanted a psychiatrist to examine her because we were very glad that she did because we <laughs> this helped us to uh, in our investigation, and uh, she wasn't uh, psychotic, and neither was her daughter. So. Uh, it's an interesting case. Yeah, that is interesting because years ago when you had mentioned flying saucers, you'd very seldom find people that really would believe in it. Mm -hmm. But as uh, in the last 15, 10, 15, 20 years, more and more people believe in them and the reports that they, uh, they read. How mm -hmm. do you account for this? I, th I think that when we're, we're going through a, a sort of process uh, that has been instigated by whatever it is. The first sightings were just flyovers, and then you had uh, the close encounters, and then you had the close encounters of the second kind, and then you had the close encounters of the third kind. It was almost a conditioning process, and as you look at the Gallup polls, which we've collected over the years, you see that the awareness factor of just the term UFO is probably one of the highest awareness factors there is. I think like 92% now of people in the world, <laughs> uh, or in this country rather, uh, know what UFO stands for. Uh, so it seems to be a conditioning uh, thing that we see, that we are f gradually accepting the existence of uh, whatever they are. But I think it's been instigated probably by them. I see. Are you working on a new book at the present time? No, not yet. I'm thinking of doing a textbook on UFOs, but right now I'm concentrating just on courses for the local community colleges and hopefully putting together something that others can use. And right from your home, you teach an astronomy course, and you have a planetarium right out there in the yard. Yes, I have a planetarium and an observatory, and it's open by appointment for small groups up to 20. Yeah, I know, because I've been, and it's well worthwhile going. We really enjoy it. Good. And the kids get a lot out of it. Right. Uh, would you say uh, children today still have a chance and should go into the field of astronomy? I think that the field of astronomy <clears throat> always will have uh, limitations unless the uh, unless NASA gets a big boost in funds or something. Usually graduates uh, of astronomy end up uh, either teaching it, if that's what they want to do, that's fine, or perhaps even in the high school, not even at the college level. Uh, planetariums uh, uh, hire astronomers. But usually, a, a professional astronomer, this is sort of a, a lower position for someone like that. You don't need someone with a degree, a PhD in astronomy. Probably the field is quite limited to uh, people who want to do research at this particular time. But I would say that if people who are, are really interested and this is what they want to do and that's their motivation and they give it all they've got, that uh, they should try, right? This really is a, a fascinating sh subject, astronomy and UFOs, and it's uh, been awfully nice of you to have us in your home to talk about these. And uh, would you say that uh, the more information people get, they shouldn't become afraid? They should uh, really uh, speak to someone who's knowledgeable in the area and get, seek some advice and not feel as though there's something wrong with them? Yeah, I think people who have experienced something that they can't explain and uh, are afraid to talk about should talk it out with someone. And 
we keep names confidential if so desired. Uh, as far as the government keeping uh, information from the people, there are probably a lot of things that they feel that if the common public knew that it would cause a, a lot of problems. Uh, but as far as a person having a UFO sighting and wanting to share it with someone, it's better to do that and then uh, end up uh, with some psychotic traits because mm -hmm. they're, they're keeping this inside, yes. Right. Well, thank you for having times past visit you in your home. And it's a pleasure to hearing all this information. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Thanks again. Oh.